Many clients want you to deliver short-term results on projects while at the same time helping them to build internal service design capabilities. Is that even realistic? Is that possible? And if so, how do you do that? Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Patrick. This is the Service Design Show, episode 115. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. And the guest in this episode is nobody less than Patrick Quattlebaum. Patrick is the founder of Harmonic Design. He's the former managing director at Adaptive Path, and you might know him as the author of the book called Orchestrating Experiences. What I'll be discussing with Patrick in this episode is what to do in situations where clients want short-term results through project work and who also want to learn the craft of service design by doing projects. I know that this was a question that I got very often when I was still doing service design on a day-to-day -day basis. And in theory, it sounds great, but in practice, you run into many, many challenges. Patrick is going to share some really inspiring examples from the work they're doing and how they are helping clients to actually achieve this. So if you stick around till the end, you'll know much better how to handle clients who want short-term results and learn the craft of service design at the same time. But it's not only external agencies or consultancies who get this challenge. If you're an in-house service designer, this challenge also probably sounds familiar to you. And to be honest, it's probably much harder to you to deal with this question because often you don't have an entire team of professionals and like-minded peers around you who you can ask for advice. Sometimes being an in-house service designer can feel quite lonely. If you're in a similar position, you might consider joining our Campfire Group, which is starting in January. The Campfire Group is a five-week mastermind program where you'll meet other in-house service designers who face the same challenges. You'll get to hear their stories and learn from each other. I know that being an in-house service designer can be overwhelming. There are so many things to do and so many people demanding things from you. It's really hard to stand still stop and reflect for a second to grow as a professional. Often you don't permit yourself the time to invest in yourself. Now, Campfire is a perfect excuse for that. As one of the previous participants said, if you feel you don't have the time to join the Campfire, you probably need it even more. If you want to be part of the next Campfire group, check out the details on how to apply at servicedesignshow.com slash campfire at the time of the recording of this video there are still a few spots left so head over to servicedesignshow.com slash campfire and check it out and now we're going to talk about how to bring service design in-house while delivering great service design projects at the same time so sit back relax and enjoy the conversation with patrick qualabaum welcome to the show patrick hey mark Nice to have you on. Looking forward to our chat today. Um, for the people who don't know who you are, could you give a brief introduction? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Patrick Quattlebaum. Uh, I'm a service designer in the United States. I'm in, a, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I, ha I own a company uh, called Harmonic Design, uh, and we specialize in service design. It's a, it's a new company. We've been around for about two and a half years. Uh, before that, uh, I was head of service design at Capital One, managing director at Adaptive Path, uh, and then I, before that, I was a chief experience officer at a, a design agency uh, here in Atlanta, and uh, before that, I owned a soccer store, or football there in, in Europe. So, no way, done a lot of th done a lot of things. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you yeah. owned a soccer store. We need yeah. to get into that uh, story a bit later. <laughs> um, awesome. So um, we're going to do a 60 second rapid fire round. Five questions. You need to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, let's do it. Yep. Patrick, what's always in your fridge? Always in my fridge. Uh, what is always in my fridge? Beer. <laughs> <laughs> Which book are I reading, if any? Uh, well, but I just finished uh, a book called uh, The Searcher 
which is a fiction book uh, based in uh, about, uh, based in about Ireland, uh, which I love the country of Ireland. Uh, and but in design wise, uh, I'm having my entire uh, team read the Trusted Advisor, which is like a classic in consulting, uh, which uh, might, might be a topic of building trust with clients and people that you work with. Hmm. We'll link to that down below. Uh, next up. So. <laughs> what superpower would you like to have? Superpower I'd like to have. Uh, well, right now, the ability to be anywhere in the world and not uh, and be safe <laughs> would, be, would be amazing right now. Seems like a superpower these days. Yeah. What did you want to become when you were a kid? Uh, I wanted to be an architect, uh, which I think I am in a, in a way. So hmm. uh, <laughs> You're just not <laughs> building yeah, uh, buildings. Really wanted to yeah. Be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And finally... Do you remember or recall your first memory of service design? Well, I mean, that gets into what is service design, right? Uh, so I, I, I can remember when I started to associate what I do with service design, because mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, it's, we're, we're a little late to using that term compared to other parts of the world. But that was about 2006 when I I, I was tired. I had one too many projects in which hired to do a certain part of a experience and realizing that I could do the work to think about the whole thing holistically and beyond, you know, just a certain channel like digital and started to find my way to a language and a community that, uh, that did similar things. Hmm. So. Around that time, 2006, seven, eight, it's sort of like um, looking back on it. There was, it's not a it, it, the rebirth of service design. Maybe uh, it seems like that a lot of uh, happened around those years. Yeah, I mean, in the United in the United States specifically, I mean, I mean, definitely this is service design thinking. Uh, what was what 2011, 10, 11? Oh yeah, yeah. The book. Yeah, yeah. I think that. That in the United States, I think, started to have people start to understand what those words mean in, in our culture, because we were very heavy user experience mm -hmm. in the United States. And there are a lot of people that um, do service design, but call themselves user experience, say strategists for designers. And there's a lot of people who, um, there's a lot of people who uh, use service design for all sorts of different things in the state so it's still semantically it's still kind of confusing for folks and there's a lot of people who actually do elements of it but i think uh oh, we're still trying to get into the community right so mm. let's not get into too much semantics uh today yeah uh, we can make <laughs> an uh an entire show about that we have know. much we have a much more important topic to talk about um because um we're going to address the challenge and uh, figure out if it's a paradox maybe of being able to deliver short-term results, outcomes through service design, while at the same time building service design capability within an organization, helping them to transform. I know that when I was still back at the agency, we got this question over and over again. I think 80% of our projects uh, uh, had this kind of element. I definitely have developed a perspective on this, but uh, I'm really curious to learn from you uh, how this works. So first of all, what is your relationship to this topic? Why is it something that's on your mind right now? Well, I think like you, I, I found it was always part of the gig, right? Um, that, uh, you know, I often call service design a, a team sport. Right, because and, and a lot of service designers kind of focus a lot on facilitation. It's a lot more than facilitation, but it definitely is a. Um, you're 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 looking to bring together and orchestrate a lot of different people towards a goal that's bigger than any particular function. And um, within organizations, this is a common problem. Whether you call it service design or not, just getting different groups to work towards the same goal is very difficult. Um, and so when a, a lot of times, and whether it was specifically asked for when the project was initiated or along the way, it was, wow, we really need to do more of this around here. Can you help us do that more? Um, I 
My mother is a teacher, or was a teacher, she's retired now. My dad was a banker, but he even on the side taught uh, finance to inmates in prison uh, to help them kind of transition back into uh, work, the, back into society. So I kind of have this, I've been told by some of my clients, I have the heart of a teacher, which I take pride in. And so at this point, I am building our company around, like this is part of the, we don't take work unless this is part of the, what we're doing. Uh, because I really believe that this is, it's, this is, should be integral to organizations. There's a role for outside uh, companies to help, but if it stays on the outside of organizations, then they won't transform. We won't see the types of experiences we want to see in the world as designers, right? Yeah, yeah. And then what, uh, when you say it's when it stays outside, when the discipline and the mindset and the attitude of service design stays something that you hire from a consulting agency right. um, and don't internalize it, right? That's what you're and, referring and the to. Hard and the hard skills, because I think that that's one thing that, you know, from my experience, what I've seen in a lot of organizations is there's almost an over-focus on mindset, uh, which is foundational. You have to have the mindset. But building expertise and going through the cycles of you can't be certified in a couple of weeks to be a designer. Um, so how do you build those hard skills? And in some cases, it's about helping designers expand their toolkit and the impact they can have in organizations. And sometimes it's helping non-designers use elements of design to do better work, um, regardless of what their role is. And those are those are different contexts, right? When you're when you're trying to help build those capabilities. Hmm. And I'm before we dive into how to actually do that. Um, I'm curious if you've seen something similar where like a lot of organizations want to become customer centric. They, I, I think they honestly want uh, to deliver better experiences for their employees, for their customers. Uh, but somehow, even after engaging in many design related human centered initiatives, sort of the core essence still doesn't change. Is, is that your experience as well? Yes, I mean, there definitely is a, uh, there's been for many years now, this kind of commander's intent from the sea level in organizations of customer centricity, right? Um, a, a lot of that I think comes from outside pressures rather than internalizing what that really means. Um, either it's, they see the competition saying and thinking they're doing it or they're looking, they're attaching that to business strategies like, you know, customer value streams and things like that. And they're, they're really trying to get the organization to get leaner and more focused on are we, are the things that we're doing as an organization creating value for customers? And often when they say customer centered at the, in the C-suite for business people, that's really what they're talking about. They're not talking about human centered design. Um, and so most of them. And so mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do in the design field is connect to that, um, that this, you know, a human centered focus focusing on, when I was at Capital One, we would talk a lot about like focusing on the needs of people. Like that was like a big kind of foundational piece to transformation, which was, are we really looking at all the humans that are part of these services and products that we're trying to create do we really understand their needs? And can we really embrace making that part of, of really how do we define success and know we're on the right track? Um, but a lot of organizations stop kind of at the, uh, getting the machine of the organization pointed towards a customer outcome without rewiring the company to really work differently. And there's a lot of uh, other disciplines within organizations that are natural allies in this for trying to change how we work. Um, but I think what designers can really bring is to keep innovating around how do you 
really um, go beyond that surface level mindset and really dig it deep into the operating model of the organization. And that I think that's that's my love of architecture, I think, because I, I do think it's an architectural problem in, in organizations. We uh, had Peter Merholtz on the show a few episodes ago and we talked about organizational design. And I think uh, that's a very important part of actually making um, uh, sustainable change or systemic change and making sure that uh, we are able to deliver upon that customer experience. Um, you mentioned, uh, we talked about services, uh, we talked about capabilities. Those are two different things, like delivering a service uh, which people can interact to, basically a business uh, offering versus uh, growing capabilities internally. How would you mm -hmm. define those? What are those outcomes for you? How do you make them tangible? For the capability building or for both? For both. Like, where is the, like, where's yeah. the, where's the difference between the two? Well, it, there's kind of a short term and a long term, right? Well, I guess there is a long, there's a long term to the, obviously to the surface as well, right? But if you look at the, and part of it is also how the, how the organization works, right? So if there's a project focus in organizations, then you can look at the unit of a project, right? As, what are the what are the outcomes this project is creating and there's a bias within most organizations for what 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 have you done for me lately right so while you may be looking at further horizon lines maybe creating a north star for something that you need to build to over time the reality is what have we what value have we created in the near term um and so ensuring that you're always connecting what you're doing to the value it's creating at different points in time is really critical. And to be honest, the same thing is true for capabilities as well, when you look at the capability to do design, which is, uh, do you see cha in, uh, changes within the organization today and how you work and use these approaches to get to better outcomes today, but also are you starting to build new muscles in the organization to drive towards something better, bigger and better in the future. And if, especially when you're working with an organization that's, that is going through some sort of transformational effort, that that's a very smart thing to connect to. Hmm. <clears throat> I know that I always found it challenging, uh, to actually do that and to, um, to get people to adopt this uh, in a long term, once we were gone after the project, that they would continue to work in this way. But I'm really curious to hear your examples. Um, mm -hmm. How do we do this? Where do you start? <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, it's not uh, easy. But yeah. it, is it even possible? That's that's sort of the uh, yeah. eventual question we need to get to. But. What have you done and what have what has worked, what hasn't worked? Right. So, I mean, the first thing, I guess, before getting to some specific examples, I mean, I think you also have, you have to think about, you have to approach these things as a long game and that maybe you're not there for the whole game. Um, and so I, I definitely have seen, I'll give an example in a second, of being at a place, trying a lot of different things, leaving, and then finding out later, oh, there was more change than I thought. It didn't feel good at the time. <laughs> it felt really frustrating, but something broke through, not just because of what I did or what my teams did, but we were just part, you never know. What I always tell people is you, there's this, there's this saying in, 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 in definitely in the U S of like, the, you know, the last straw, right. It's usually used in a negative form of like, that was the last straw. And then, you know, I, I got angry or something changed. Um, you never know if you're the last straw uh, or if you're the straw before the last straw, <laughs> but you're part of that journey. Right. Um, and especially if you're an outside consultant, it's very rare that you're going to be there. The, the whole transformational journey. Um, so one example of that would be about 10 years ago, I, I was working with a retailer who was, um, you know, the, the form of design being practiced there was mainly user experience within within digital 
And they were kind of pre-product design, like pre-product managers, pre-agile even, um, and had other design. They basically outsourced a lot of design. But anyway, I was working with them on a, a new service that was one of the top like four or five initiatives for the organization for five years. So it was this, this big deal, one of the strategists for it. And then as we were, as we were working on it, it had a huge digital component, but also connecting to, to hundreds of stores and changing employee behavior. Um, and the organization was also finally starting to use Agile. So you had this kind of explosion of activity and the organ on top of that, the marketing team decided what we were working on was like critical to their marketing strategy and accelerated the program by months. And so one of the things that I, I did on that project and my team did was, and I think this is, a, a, you know, never, you never know exactly what the pathway is to get to building these capabilities and embracing these approaches while driving to the outcome. So we knew we had to launch the service. <laughs> that wasn't a, that wasn't a choice. So we wanted to make it as good as possible, but how do you start to get these approaches? Because when you're starting to have hundreds of people work on something, their, their vectors going different directions. So some of the things that I, that I did on it was that started to pull from service design. The f first thing I learned was whenever I said service design, it kind of had people shut down because the context of this is 10 years ago in the U S that barely meant anything. Um, and so, and they heard service and they heard one thing and they heard design and they were thinking UI design. So I started to just play with the language and do things like teach people service blueprinting, but I called it experience blueprinting. It's like, okay, you know me as helping with the experience. I'm going to call it that. Um, and even teaching competitors how to do it because they were critical to helping this big project get done. And the more the people did these approaches, I, I was betting on it would get stuck in the culture. Um, the, the other thing was just being generous. So demonstrating little design methods and meetings that you, I was just invited in and not facilitating <laughs> um, and just showing how these little approaches that we do as designers can help move the ball forward. Um, demonstrating the value and every time we demonstrated the value they would the leadership would say that helps and they would create roles to do it so we went from what's a service blueprint or an experience blueprint to those are helpful to can we have four people start doing that on the program instead of you running around by yourself doing it I'm like absolutely and created them in their team um and so it's, you know, that's a large scale project example, but it's all about demonstrating and adapting and customizing consistently where I've seen, I have seen consistently in my career of companies providing organizations with uncustomized playbooks of how you do this. And then they, it falls apart. And so it's all about bespoke, customize, figure out a way to get it work in that culture, keep trying different things. And don't have this pride of, but this is how, what I call it, or this is what I, the way I think it should be done. If you're too academic or rigid about it, then it, it will, it will, you know, it consistently will fail in the culture. You've got to make it theirs. Hmm. So many things to uh, unpack in uh, this story already. When, um, you said I, I was teaching uh, service blueprinting to the people around me, mm. even even the competitors. One of the questions uh, that I have and uh, that has arisen over the years is, can you actually teach this? And it sounds silly because, mm -hmm. like, you can you can everybody can learn the process of journey mapping or service blueprinting, but can you actually teach this uh, in a way that people? do it in the way it's supposed to be. Right, right. Well, there's a couple of challenges there. I mean, blueprinting is a good example. So, you know, because I, I help organizations with this in kind of two different forms. So there's the project form of it, right? Like establishing a new service or maybe reimagining it. And they're using blueprinting as a technique to 
um, to design the service, clarify how it, how it could work, and using it as a way to bring together people from different teams that are going to implement different elements of it so they can all get their fingerprints on here's what we're going to make together and then using it as a as a touchstone for people to come back to over and over on the project so in a project context and kind of getting people to participate start understanding the value of it teaching other people to help facilitate it that that works pretty well now, when the project ends, that's the big question, right? Is now do they understand, I've got one example of doing it on one project. Uh, and and uh, there's, a, there's a desire from organizations that, okay, now we have the recipe. Uh, but in reality, you have, you know how to make one dish. <laughs> and uh, and every, every project's a little bit different. And so that's where... If it's a one and done project scenario, I don't think it's realistic to expect that people learn a technique like that. You have to have repeated uh, experience with it. And what 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 I found works well is to go through cycles of showing, doing it with, being training wheels, going through a few cycles, mm -hmm. and and working with companies to identify. There's a difference between participating in something like blueprinting or journey mapping versus really needing it um, and knowing when you should do it and how to do it. And then that takes identifying some key personnel to invest more in to help build their mastery. Exactly. And then they're, yeah. then, they're, then they're fine and they can then be the master to teach other people. But expecting everyone knows how to do blueprinting after a three-month project is highly unrealistic. Yeah, and the thing, the the uh, secret ingredient that you mentioned is experience, because that's all, that's the thing you do not see in a visualization of whatever kind. It's uh, even quite deceptive. It looks really simple, and that's the beauty and the power of it. But you don't see sort of the the thinking and the reasoning that went into it, and that's the thing that's really hard to teach. That is something that you gain. By doing it over and over and yeah, over really again. Yeah, really through experience. Yeah, the, the, the director, Richard Linklater, who directed Boyhood and Slacker and a bunch of films, famous director, he, his student film was called You Can't Learn to Plow by Reading Books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I, think, I, I think of that all the time and talk to, client, to my clients about it is you can't go through a training course and suddenly do it. And there's a combination of... of under, you know, like reading, experiential learning, doing it on projects, getting coaching, you know, and then eventually you can build that, build that mastery. And, you know, and it took me years to feel, I mean, I still feel like every time I do it, there's so, I'm learning so much because these are complex things that we design. That's why you need these methods and you're always learning how to do it better and better. So, it, you know, downloading that into someone's brain, in a project or in a classroom is uh, is is not again not, not realistic. <laughs> you mentioned uh, something about uh, showing demonstrating value, and I'm curious. Like, and we all also said in this episode already that uh, sometimes the value is only uh, harvested year, months or years after you're you're gone. What have you yeah. found to be successful ways to actually show it? Well, while doing it, like the short term results, short term value, it's really hard to capture and convey. Is well, it part question of the, mark? What, yeah. yeah, I mean, in service design in general, like if you if you're doing the work that's pre implementation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's if it's big enough and complicated enough, and depending how fast the organization moves, right, it could be months before you see you see any result. If it's something that exists, then I'm always making part of these projects identifying levers that could be pulled faster, even in parallel to the strategy work, because a lot of this is strategy work. Um, because if it's a living, breathing journey or, or service, you can, you can and, and if you're working in more agile ways, you can make changes to it even while you're figuring out what to do next. So that's one one approach I often use is, is to kind of show the value. Um, the second would be 
a, a lot of what we do in service design, like if, a thing I hear a lot in organizations, whether it's internal teams or, or external, is we don't have time for this. That it's adding Classic. time yeah. to get to the outcomes. Um, so part of showing the value earlier is when you have the opportunity to do this, and it does take time, is building the case and getting the people who are involved in it to say to management, I am set up to, for success better. I am going to be able to go faster. Uh, I have more confidence we're going to do a good job, right? That is value uh, because we're, we build, a lot of design is about building confidence. Hmm. Confidence that we can't predict the future, but we feel more confident that we are being intentional about what we're doing. And for something as complex as a service, that I know what's happening to the left and right of me <laughs> and that we're all gonna head towards the same destination together. And when you can get those people to say it, not you. Uh, and I had, we, our, our team had a, a project like this recently where we had the team saying to their management, you know, we have clearer requirements than we've ever had before for going into publication. Uh, we, uh, we have better feedback and confidence from our customers that we're making this for and the people who are going to be part of it, that this is desirable to them. And so they're saying these things, not us mm -hmm. and not the other designers. That is value. Value is one thing that I think is overlooked often is it's valuable to have a good day at work. So if people are enjoying themselves, they feel more confident, they feel like they're going to reach their outcomes, then that is a huge impact and yeah. that changes cultures. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think um, it's really easy to get sucked in into the existing way an organization uh, measures value. And when you try to do that from a service design perspective, you get stuck really quickly because we have other ways of uh, demonstrating value and uh, yeah. experiential value. and. Uh, testimonials, uh, those are valuable as well. The fact that their organization isn't measuring them right now doesn't mean we shouldn't put that forward, right? Correct, correct. And, and, and that's part of the, when you talk about building the capability, I mean, part of that mindset is like intellectual, but there's the emotional, for humans, there's the emotional part of it as well, right? So I might intellectually have the mindset of this is a great way to work, um, but emotionally and feeling very passionate and wanting to get more people to do it and work this way. That again is how you, how you can change a culture because the the logic is you know it's that logic and emotion combination that's that's really you know, it's, it's really important. And 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 again, those things aren't often measured. HR measures it, so that's a that's a partner as well. Right. I mean, good HR organizations measure those things. So that is a partner we sometimes look at for this capability building is building towards better outcomes for customers and the business. But also we always look at the employee dimension of any service, both in terms of the employees that are part of delivering it or more degrees away from it right in terms of the culture of the organization and that that's something that that is is very critical to again making that full value proposition hmm. of what what we do and why we do it and why more people should adopt these approaches i want to get back to one more thing that you mentioned um as as an example of uh being the uh, ad hoc facilitator or the in, impromptu facilitator. What I found as as a struggle was um, as designers, as service designers, we have quite a strategic perspective often on the challenges that we're working on, but we also have the skill uh, to be very uh, hands-on, very practical. And in my practice, I've seen that once you get practical once you get your hands dirty it's really hard to go back to that strategic uh perspective so sort of the people in the room don't um, see you as see you as the working class rather than somebody who's going to guide 
the strategy. I'm mm-hmm. curious if you've seen similar things happening because I, that's for me that was a major challenge. Like uh, you couldn't get, you couldn't facilitate the workshop even if you knew you could because the other people in the room uh, wouldn't uh, would get a different perspective and see see you as a different kind of partner. No, that's that is a challenge because you know in, in you know what you're doing as a practitioner is working in modes, right? I'm in facilitation mode versus exactly detailed design mode versus this mode. Um, I, you know what I what I found is I mean I can just tell you what I do, which is I kind of approach it as I'm I'm here as a guide and a consultant. But I show up and I immediately, like, literally roll my sleeves up, right? If I'm wearing a long suit shirt, and say, like, this is part of part of what I'm doing is got helping guide and teach you to do these things and being a strategist. But I'm not a. There is no thinkers and makers. I'm both, uh, and I roll my sleeves up. And by getting into the details, that is helping me then educate, like. Get, be thinking bigger and better about what we're all doing, and I also I'm also experiencing the work in different contexts, and so I'm part of the team, and also getting everyone to understand. If you think of yourselves as implementation, you're also we're bringing you in earlier to help shape what we're going to implement. Uh, if you are someone who's normally in strategy, we're trying to pull you in a little bit deeper to understand the implications of what you thought versus what is possible. And so in the end, trying to model that behavior, um, that being said, that's a very unusual way to think and work <laughs> that, um, of this kind of hybrid, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in generalism and being able to flex in different ways and that organizations over specialize. Um, and so, it, it, but I, I've had that same experience that you've had that's been my technique, you know, to it. I mean, I don't know when I grew a beard and as it got gray or I got a little more, uh, people listen to me a little bit, more, yeah. which is completely unfair. Right. They, but, uh, but that's true. Like people project and have kind of a look at you and assume things just by what they see you doing and who yeah. you are. Yeah. And, and which is incredibly, uh, challenging for people who, uh, if you're trying to change your, how people, you know, the, the, the impact that you can have and break through those biases. hundred percent. Like you don't want to wear, you want to, you don't want to wear a suit because you want to keep the identity uh, of who you are. But at the same time, like sometimes you might need to wear a suit to actually get the, the credibility or the acknowledgement, uh, the, the seat at the table in order to create the change that you're looking to create. Yeah. And, it, and it's important to remember that because I, I approach people and approach like not, not that way at all. So I'm very much of like, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a hard worker. It's, it's, it's in my DNA for my family. And so I'm like, I don't know if I put a, a, a suit on, it's inhibiting me from like getting, getting busy. <laughs> um, but you know, people and cul- you, and that's the other thing is, you know, going back to like capabilities and culture and stuff. I mean, that's the thing you have to really, you have to understand when you're engaging with different people, you probably didn't always have that experience. It's certain cultures, an organization has its culture and subcultures, right? That you're trying to navigate. And in the end, if your goal is to help build these capabilities to get more people to do what we believe the service designers is, is extraordinarily valuable to organizations and, and changing the world, then you have to figure out, find those levers, adapt and keep and keep trying to find the, the pathway to the change you want to see. Hmm. Uh, but but that often is and, and, and I as a as a white male in the United States have it easier than most people. And I, and I know that. And it's something that is a is a great challenge for people who have amazing talents and trying to break through these these biases um, that that we see in in society and organizations. What have you seen uh, around capability building being uh, a side project? So starting off with service design, 
it, it's a it's a really fun and enjoyable process. People actually like it and uh, enjoy the, especially the, the the process in the beginning uh, a lot. You get to talk to uh, customers, you get to do workshops, you you get yeah. to uh, ideate on new uh, ideas. That's all fun, and then at some point, things actually need to change physically in in the system and the ecosystem. Th people need to start doing different things reallocating resources and then it starts to hurt and uh, it's also the same with capability building like it's nice to to learn an interview technique or know how to i don't know run a workshop but it starts to hurt when your regular job hasn't changed right it's a lot to unpack there i mean that is very true there is the the common uh, journey of someone that does goes through this for the first time is confusion and then they do the get into the research and they go oh this feels good and they do the ideation like this feels great uh, but there actually is a downside down emotional downturn even before you finish the project which is oh, oh no like we have to like make decisions or in a lot of organizations we're oh we're cutting across the grain people you know i you know definitely see in organizations like expecting even if you say it a, a thousand times they still think they're getting something different out of the work <laughs> um, because it is at a level where you're trying to shape you it's a project to create projects to create a lot of work uh and so that and then you start to like get intersect with how do we do work around here? How do things get funded? How do you keep these things aligned? And people, and then a lot of people think when you, you're like, all right, good, we have like a vision and a plan, we're done. It's like, no, that was like the first step of the many steps. And, and you know, I, so one of the things is finding, we take people through it, not everyone has to fall in love with that problem, but you have to make sure on the team that you have the right people and some partners that, that love the problem of, all right, how are we going to get this done? You know, how are we going to navigate this organization to create something that is typically divided up into different functional areas and they all do their separate parts and it never gets back together again. Right. And, and so I think part of that is like part of the, when you're building the team, like making sure you have those people. So my team's working with someone right now, a team right now, where one of the people on the team were like three months before we're going to be at that step. And she's already asked what happens then? Cause I want to make sure we start to get ready. And I'm like, all right, we, that is the right person we need on the team right now because service design is not just the fun part. <laughs> that's um, what people see on the outside. Right. And that's, that, that's the superficial layer. Yeah. Well, that's the theater. That's the theater. Yes. I mean, we yes. see a lot of that in the United States with design thinking. I mean, and I, I separate the two terms. We won't get into that, but like, there's a lot of things in the U S around this theater of either going through the process of like doing some research, going outside in, identifying some stuff, coming up with some ideas, and then it kind of fizzles. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or even going a little bit further and it feels good to go through the project. And then a few months later, it's like, whatever happened to what we were talking about? Yeah. And that, that to me is, and this has been tough as uh, mainly we're outside of organizations, but I'm very passionate about when I was adapt the path, we talked about this all the time. Like we do not want to be this journey map on the wall that's, I, w I had a company one time I worked with where like they had personas on the wall and they were, they were literally faded. And I asked, what are those? And they were like, oh, I don't know. They've been up on there on the wall. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to do work like that. <laughs> I don't want that to be the outcome of going through and having a wonderful journey with a client. It felt really good and they loved it. And then you would, and then nothing ever happened of it. So that's what I've been working on with my career and trying to build our company to like how keep working, getting better and better of not being in that position because it, hmm. it, it doesn't feel good um, in the long term. So you can, you can get, and that's what happens with organizations. They can get, they can fall in love with the, the short burst of activity and then, 
and then win the first lap of a multi-lap race, you know, and then lose the plot, right? So, I think it was uh, Hartmut Esslinger, the founder of Frog Design, who was also on the show. He he m phrased this as corporate entertainment, uh, and you mentioned it as as theater. theater. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing, and it's the lack of accountability for the results that we deliver. Um, and that's that's also, I think, maybe a, a secret ingredient that we haven't mentioned explicitly yet. But when you want to deliver outcomes, you need to uh, have people who are accountable for those outcomes. Like if nobody yeah. cares if that service actually get gets implemented or if those capabilities really grow, then you're you're fighting a, a lost battle at the start. Yeah, you have to work it from the bottom up and the top down, right? So, but you, you'll always get the middle, and you hear this all the time in organizational change, right? The middle is the is the thing. You can have a an executive who's like, I, I went, you know, I went to D school at Stanford. I I saw design thinking in action. We should be doing this and bring it into the organization, bring in a company to help train people, certify people, all that. You can have people who are doing that in the trenches going, this is great. This, this opens up my whole world. I, I never, I didn't even know this. I could make money doing this type of stuff. Uh, and then there's the middle, which is how you keep score. What are the incentives? What are we doing this quarter? Like that middle part is the long game of change. Uh, you can't change that through a project. You can't change that through training. You can't add design to your onboarding of employees and expect that everyone's a designer of your design organization. Yeah. Like that's the hard, long work. Um, and so, but I love that. Uh, I love that long game that you're trying trying to play and being part of it. And again not saying that what I'm doing or my team's doing is the silver bullet or the answer, or even like going to get to that destination while I'm working with the company. It's just helping move towards an inevitable, hopefully what is an inevitable future, right? Is building that case that they will get there at some point. So it's the operational model, as you mentioned, I think I, I coined it as a, as the operating system of the organization, uh, but yes, I'm, I'm curious, how do you actually do that or stick around long enough to <laughs> get there when that's not what clients often approach you for? Unless, of course, you've you've built that positioning and people start to recognize you for this specific thing. But usually yeah. they, they don't. They see they want to do a service yeah, design project and, 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 and they don't see the implications. Yeah, yeah, they definitely experience both. So. You know, sometimes it's, you know, it was working with one company with a executive who had that vision, started to do, you know, did the work, uh, got people excited, helping them start to think in terms of like designing and, and experiences, more of a service mindset, things like that. Um, trying to get the headcount to be able to have those, uh, to have service designers on the team that didn't have before instead of. Uh, using an outsider and we're going to help them build that capability and then he left and so no one else picked up the torch right and so we hit a wall uh, other organizations we're working with one right now that their goal is to build this type of culture uh, working with people very high up in the organization not going to be easy but there's multiple people who want to see this type of future not to be and again i think this is really important not to be not service design, mm -hmm. but an outcome, right, of an organization that consistently delivers value to people, whether they're a customer or an employee, and does it faster and better than they do now, and hopefully differentiated greatly from their competitors. That's what they yeah. want, yeah. right? And so, service design what, is just a way to get there. Con yeah, exactly. So connecting it to those forces. So if you if your goal is let's build service design, that is a that's that's a very um, that that is that will be a uh, 
a goal that is detached from what the organization is trying to do. Mm-hmm. You want a Trojan horse that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and you want to take little bits and pieces and get it into the culture. So, you know, Jamin Hegeman, you know, one of the global conferences for SCN, you know, I gave a talk about like giving it away. And I, re- I believe that it's like giving away these things of like, you know, you said before, like, I don't know if they're going to, they'll do it well. Well, sometimes you have to take the risk of just getting it out there. Um, and there's this kind of balancing act because because there can be a fear of, I, I teach a lot of people how to do it at a surface level. They all start doing it and it doesn't work. And then no one wants it. A disappointment. Yeah. Or, but also if you're a, a person or a small team, how many people can you work with in a year at an organization? So that's going to be too slow. So, you know, finding this balance of finding people, spending time with them, helping build the capability, but taking some risks. So you have to still have to take some risks because if you're too orderly about it, you know, it's too slow. Hmm. Um, and hmm. companies want to move faster and there are competing solutions to those bigger problems I was talking about that aren't designed that are promising I can get you to that place. And so if you're, if you rest, if you, if you're too slow about it, then, then you'll have other, you'll have other approaches that could beat you to the transformational change you want to see. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a complex environment. Any organization, a few thousand people, a few hundred people changing something's hard. And, and then you're, uh, going to be left disappointed and frustrated that I don't know, the marketing department got the budget to do the user research part or the digital right. department, the IT department suddenly owns customer experience, right? And mm-hmm. that's, right. that's reality. They're doing, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're doing what? You know, yeah. I hear that a lot. Wait, did yeah. you hear yeah. that so-and-so is doing this? And like, yeah, everyone's trying to have an impact. Um, which is a healthy thing in an organization. If if every if if you were the only one trying to do something new and impactful, that would not be a place I'd want to work. So you know, you know, organizations are are competitive environments um, by nature. Um, and that's a whole other topic of how you partner with all those other groups on on common outcomes that you're driving towards and and, and, and building new approaches that kind of blend service design with other approaches. But in the end, you have to always remember that there's a lot of people trying to to push forward. Um, and so if you overthink it, that someone's going to go past you. So you kind of, ha- again, it's this kind of combination of being strategic, but trying stuff and taking a few risks and getting those learning cycles in as quickly as possible so you can find the right approach. What When... Uh... A starting uh, service designer within an uh, agency would approach you with a question. Listen, I got a question from a client to help them out with a project and at the same time help them to <laughs> grow this capability. What would your advice be to this person? First of all, make sure that that ask is genuine. Um, so like I said, we... We, if, if we're approached for work, we really make sure that that is a true outcome. And How do you gauge that, that? Truly valuable. Um, asking a lot of questions about why, right? So you can always go back to your five whys. Just drill into it. So, so why? You know, because is it somebody who, you know, read a book on service design, or I get people who read my book that I wrote, Chris Risden, and go like, I, I really like this. Like, I want to do this. It's like, okay, you know, so you're an org, I said, okay, so you're someone who wants to orchestrate, but tell me more about your organization, right? Um, is this bigger than this project? Do you see the, the um, partnerships internally? Do you see how it's like, are, is it, I'm, if we do this on the project, I'm going to be giving you advice on what to do after the project. I want to think longer term with you. Um, is that really what you're trying to do? Um, and it's not a sales technique to like make it a bigger project. What it really is, is if we're going to go through this again, I'm, I'm really like, I want to make sure we're gonna, we're driving towards a clear outcome that's bigger than this project. So this would be like a step towards something. 
Um, so it's just doing some due diligence um, and also some education of like, this is not easy, <laughs> you know? And so we want this to be a, a enjoyable project, but we want to drive to support both of those outcomes. So as you might be thinking about how we might implement what we might come up with as the service or a new journey, how are we going to implement capabilities longer term? So that was the first piece of advice. Make sure that's a genuine uh, ask. Yeah. Anything else? The, sec the second thing is how you build the team, right? So it's one thing to put a team together where people will learn on it, start learning service design. Um, uh, where, what parts of the organization do they come from? They represent a broad piece of it. Uh, do they have the time built in to their schedule to do both the project and to learn and reflect? That's a big challenge because, you know, you know, we definitely believe and tr try to help organizations think about uh, focus on a key initiative as an individual and don't spread them out as a say a designer on five things and one of them is this. Like they've got to immerse themselves in it. Uh, that's good for just the project and the problem you're trying to solve, much less learning and learning how and being able to reflect. So those are some other things of making sure the team you're building is a strong team and that as you build your project plan, what we're trying to get better and better at is like, how do you build those learning reflection, kind of like a before, during, after. So like prepping, doing it, reflecting, how do you build those rhythms into the project so that you don't, you don't lose sight of, remember, we're doing this both to learn and build the capability and do the work because the, the work of the project can often overshadow right the learning uh, objectives yeah those are a lot of uh prerequisites or demands up front to yeah. somebody who might still need to get the confidence in this approach right um mm -hmm. is it what it is or should we should we how how purist should we be about this or how pragmatic well, it's tough, right? Because I mean, whether you're an outside consultant or internal trying to, to do this, like you have to kind of stand firm on, I don't think it's purity to stand firm on if we go past this line, the efficacy of this approach, mm -hmm. it will not, it just will not work. Um, that being said, uh, uh, I think a lot of it comes in adjusting along the way, right? Because it's, this is how you set it up, but as you get into it, the reality is something could change. And then you can't be too rigid. Right. So then you can't be, hey, remember, you said you were going to be on this 100 percent and you're only on at 50 percent. It's kind of like, OK, let's deal with this. Like, how might we either increase your capacity back so you're learning? Because if you're only in half the stuff, you can't learn it. Um, or do I just need to adapt to this change and rethink our objectives as a result and reset expectations of what we're doing? If you ignore it or stay too rigid, then it you're not you're not designing along the way, right? Because it's constantly tacking towards the outcomes. Um, but I think setting those expectations up front is so important, though, because it's kind of where we started with like, well, what are realistic expectations of what you can even learn in a project? And then if you're not even doing a minimum threshold to create a good learning experience for the capabilities and do the work. Well, then you can't eat, you, you can't even meet those expectations. So, you know, I, I think it's about, you know, and, you know, having that open dialogue with your partners, whether you're internal or external on how are we doing towards the outcomes of the project? How are we doing towards the learning outcomes? Always talking about both of them and talking about how to do better or what might to do next, what might change afterwards as a result of the experience you're actually having on the, the project. It's probably um, when you're not attuned to having that conversation, your client won't be either. Like, don't expect them to raise this topic. Uh, that's what I found, at least. You have to, it has to come from you and you have to be uh, uh, very on top of it. Like, you can, yeah. you, you will get lost in the the practical work, the, the rolled up sleeves work and then, yeah. This is also a, a strong reminder. No, it, it really, and I hear this from my 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 designers all the time. It's it's a it's a tough, it's it's a, 
I, I think that what what we what I the work I believe in is again not easy to do, and you can get tilt one way or the other too much. Like I'm facilitating too much, or I'm rolling up my sleeves too much, and so you always you have to just continually to reflect and try to get that that right balance, uh, and definitely have gotten it right, gotten it wrong. I mean, it's always a learning process uh, because each project and group of people is a little a little bit different. Mm. Um, but it's being mm. reflective of that and understanding, you know, really embracing that the, the capability building, while it's not, as, not that easy to do, the capability building is, is, is really a long-term investment that the organization is making and being a good steward of that um, and, and making sure you're talking about that, but that's valuable. And is the, is the team and, and you as the service designer set up for success, right? And keep talking about that kind of, I often talk to people about this is kind of our meta project. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to create great results for the service, but our, our meta project is capability building, change, doing this more. Um, if we lose sight of that along the way, then, uh, then uh, that, that, that one of the reasons you said you wanted to do this project and do it in this way, because you could have just gotten a company just to do it for you. Uh, if you want to do it with and build these capabilities, then it is a different type of project hmm. and, and everyone has to commit to them. <clears throat> it's about zoom, zoom levels. Uh, and even if your client doesn't explicitly ask for you to zoom out and show the bigger picture, it's sort of your, uh, you need to do it. Uh, and you need to show how a single service design project fits into uh, a bigger picture, a more long-term sustainable picture, the, the roadmap, you need to show the roadmap for three years, even if they just have a three month horizon. Um, and, right. and that's right. Because even for your client, it might not yet be part of a bigger plan, but you and I know that it has to be part of a bigger plan to, to be successful. Right. Is there anything that we should have discussed, which we haven't done at this moment. I, I don't know. I think if we open another can of can of worms, and the we'll box, for another box, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's. Uh, what we'll do is we'll invite the listeners and viewers of the show to leave comments, ask questions. If they want to reach out to you to continue the conversation, is there a way to do so? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, on Twitter, I am PT Quadalbom. Uh, uh, and uh, or or at, or uh, you can also get me at uh, at Harmonic Design, which is our uh, our URL is thisisharmonic.com. So you can uh, reach out to me is there as well, and we're on Twitter and all those good things. Awesome! I'll make sure to add all the relevant links to the show notes. Patrick, uh, like you said, we opened uh, a new Pandora's box and probably mm -hmm. uh, raised more questions than given answers, but that's uh, our job here on the show. Thanks uh, for sharing this and um, thanks for making the time to reflect and be on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. What is your biggest takeaway from this conversation with Patrick? Leave a comment down below and let us know. And don't forget if you're an in-house service designer who wants to hear the stories from people in a similar position who face the same challenges, make sure to check out the campfire. You can find it at servicedesignshow.com slash campfire. If you want to see more videos that help you to design services that win the hearts of people and business, check out this next video because we're going to continue over there. See ya.